yeah, thanks a lot, um, Derek, for for having me here. Um, it's definitely a nice series of, of webinars. Um, so quite unfortunate that there's such a long break in between. And uh, yeah, I would love to see the Shuba one day. Actually, I haven't seen it myself. Um, yeah, but today I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, lovebirds. So uh, my name is Sasha Duker. My pronouns are his, him, and I'm the Lovebird Project Coordinator for the World Parrot Trust, which is a very fancy title, I think. Um, yeah, so um, here on the, on the picture, you can see uh, one of the this nine species of the lovebirds, Lillian's lovebird, sitting on an euphorbia tree. Um, that's a picture that I took in Malawi. And um, in the local language, they would call the, the lovebird um, Chimbuli. In Chishiwa, it's called Chimbuli, which means as much as stupid. Um, and I was very shocked by that because, um, yeah, I was thinking, I'm working with parrots. I know they are one of the most intelligent. Um, group of birds. So how can the locals in Malawi call these birds stupid? Um, I'm going to tell you more about that later. So um, yeah, first of all, I would like to introduce myself a little bit um, and talk about the work that I, that I did. How, how did I get to work in parrot conservation, in African parrot conservation? And um, then I'm going to dive into the, the lovebird work that I'm currently doing for the World Parrot Trust. So um, I started, I have developed an interest in parrots in particular from when I was really, really small um, as a child. But um, I started uh, my research on parrots with my Master of Science um, in uh, Göttingen in Germany. So I'm based in Schwane in South Africa, in Pretoria. But um, originally, I'm from, from Germany. So you might hear it from my, from my accent, which I got just told today is still quite strong, apparently. <laughs> So um, on this picture, you can see me in uh, Cameroon, in Southwest Cameroon, where I was doing my first studies on the African gray parrot. So I was doing um, population estimates there, together with the uh, university, but also with the Coral Brain Forest Conservation Society. So um, yeah, I had worked with, with parrots before, um, and I obviously had seen a lot of uh, caged up parrots um, in living rooms, but um, also at a vet that I was working directly after my high school. Um, he was specialized on parrots. So I had seen a lot of, uh, a lot of gray parrots, but uh, this individual that you can see here on the right uh, bottom side, that was the first one that I saw in the wild. And, um, I got, I actually, in this moment, I heard them and I, I ran and to, to spot it. Um, and it gave me goosebumps seeing such a healthy and um, awake individual of an, of an African gray parrot. So I had never seen a gray parrot like this. Um, on the left hand side uh, of the picture, you can see their, their natural nesting cavities where they're breeding. Um, yeah, and this, so I was working in the a primary rainforest, a lowland rainforest, um, the pictures you saw just now, but I was also working in um, small villages and on an oil palm plantation. So I was uh, looking at population, at how the population is doing, how is the density of the, um, of the gray parrots in, in that area. Yeah, and on the right, uh, Bottom side, you can see that we were also um, hanging some some uh, nesting boxes because because I had heard that um, one thing they would suffer from is a loss of, of nesting trees. So I thought, um, let's try it out and uh, provide them some uh, nesting boxes. Um, but yeah, it should turn out later on that uh, <clears throat> the densities in all the three habitats, so in the um, in the lowland rainforest, in the um, 
villages, but also in the oil palm plantation were really, really, really low. So uh, up to today, um, no parrot has actually entered the, the um, breeding boxes and that's five years ago. Um, yeah, so uh, there must be another reason why, why the densities are so low. And um, I was assuming that it, it might stem from the from the bird trade from so these birds the African grey parrots are highly sought after and well known um, and yeah at that time it was still legal to um, to capture these birds from the wild and export them in Cameroon so they had an export quota of 3,000 birds per year yeah which has fortunately changed so then after um, uh, Cameroon, I went to uh, the Seychelles Islands to, to work on the Seychelles National Bird, the um, Seychelles Black Parrot. Um, so my job title there was the Black Parrot Conservation Officer, also very, very fancy. <laughs> um, and here you can see me doing nest checks. So we were doing breeding monitoring um, in the palm trees that they nest in. Um, yeah, and one uh, major thing that, that they would suffer from is uh, invasive species, um, in particular rats that would enter the, the nesting cavities and feed on the eggs, and um, some ants as well. They are called yellow crazy ants, and they would spray a uh, sort of acid into the um, young's eyes, and then they would suffocate, and then they could um, the ants could come into the nest in really, really high numbers and uh, feed on the protein of the dead chick. So, um, yeah, these were the, the main things that I was working on there. I was also doing a population estimate there to see how, how the population is doing. They only occur on, on Palen, which is a 40 square kilometer big island. And, um, yeah. So it's quite a fragile uh, population and estimated at about, at about 1,000 uh, individuals, a bit more than 1,000 individuals. Okay, so afterwards, um, and I always say I finally got upgraded to work with the um, colorful parrots. Um, as a gray parrot, yeah, it's gray, the black parrot is black. But uh, the lovebirds are very, very charming, uh, small parrots. Um, we have nine different species uh, on the African continent, which you can see here. And this is how they are distributed. Um, so all over Sub-Saharan Africa, this is the uh, bird life distribution maps that you can see here. Um, yeah, then we have uh, four sp special um, lovebird species, which are called the white eyering species. And um, out of these four species, three are currently listed as threatened on the IUCN um, list. And uh, the black cheek lovebird, which is um, this one here, um, it has the smallest distribution, which you can see here in, in Zambia. Yeah, and the, the major threats to the lovebirds are uh, trade um, still and uh, habitat loss is a very, very um, big um, threat to them because um, Africa is a continent with the, with the highest deforestation rate at the moment. Um, and another threat that had been identified is the poisoning at waterholes, which I will tell you more about on the next slides. And um, due to their high dependency on, on surface water, so um, yeah, what we know of is that the, the Lillian's lovebirds and also the black cheek lovebirds, they need to come down um, to drink at least twice a day. And um, yeah, due to climate change, the, the water holes, especially during the dry season, get very scarce. Um, yeah, so how, how did I actually approach the, uh, the, the lovebird work? Um, how, how did I identify um, what must be done? Um, so there was a paper 
published by my, by my colleague and uh, a lot of co-authors about the research and conservation of the larger parrots of Africa and Madagascar. So this is, there has been a, a review of the knowledge gap and opportunities. So this is basically a summary of, of everything was what was done in the past on, uh, in terms of research and everything that needs to be done. And now I want to yeah, go ahead and uh, focus on the lovebirds because this paper doesn't, uh, doesn't tackle the lovebirds for several reasons. Um, yeah, and then uh, this paper is again a multi co author approach. It um, <clears throat> consults uh, many, many experts that have done research on, on lovebirds all over Africa. For example, um, Dr. Tiwong Gigawa, um, who has been working with the World Parrot Trust for, for several years now. And I'm going to introduce you to her later on as well. Um, yeah, and out of this, uh, this uh, research uh, also followed my, my PhD on, on lovebirds genetics that I'm currently pursuing. I'm also going to tell you about this just now. Um, as I said, one of the uh, highest threats to lovebirds, because they are so charming, they are so, so beautiful, people want to keep them in, in their houses, in their in cages, of course. Um, and this has been especially um, an issue in the past. So, for example, in uh, the 80s, from 1980 to 1990, um, the Fisher's lovebird, <clears throat> which is native to Tanzania, um, it was the, with half a million individuals, it was the most traded bird um, in the world. And even as you can see here in 2018, there's still a high demand in, in, in lovebirds and they are highly traded. So these are all um, lovebirds that are marked as, as captive bred. So South Africa is not the range of the fishers lovebirds, they come from, from Tanzania. Um, but there's a, yeah, a lot of uh, high number of exports. So, and they are all, um, yeah, being labeled as, as captive bred. So, um, yeah, the lovebirds have been traded since, since four centuries. It was the first lovebird um, which was imported to the UK was in the in 1600. And uh, ever since people also breed them so that we have now a lot of different um, color mutations and these are only some of them. So uh, I, was, I was talking to Dr. Gawa, um, who is Malawian and who had only seen the wild Lillian's lovebirds. And um, she said uh, she couldn't believe that, that this was an actual Lillian's lovebird um, on the picture. Yeah, and to make this even a little bit more confusing, um, uh, eight of these nine species in captivity can freely hybridize. And hybridization is something when, when two species can interbreed with each other. And in, in the case of the lovebirds, they can produce fertile offspring. So the offspring can also produce more offspring again. Um, and this is a list of, of eight of the nine species and how they can um, hybridize with each other. So this one is um, a cross between a Lillian's lovebird and a Fisher's lovebird. And this one, for example, is a cross between a rosy faced lovebird and a black cheek lovebird. So it looks like a rosy faced lovebird, but it has the white eye ring that the black cheek lovebird has, and it also has a darker mask. Um, on top of this, we do have um, escapee populations because of the, the trade, they had been shipped uh, all over the world. And um, yeah, it, was, it, it led to color mutations as we saw, but also to escapee populations. So um, escapee population is when, when they basically escape from the, from the cage or from the aviary, and then they are able to establish a population and thrive in the wild. So for the rosy face lovebird, that meant that we now have populations here in, uh, in the US, but also in, um, 
in Europe, as well as in, in parts of Africa where they don't belong, like here in Pretoria, for example, uh, I have seen them flying around. Um, then there are hybrid, even hybrid SKP populations and populations uh, of um, species which are in each other's species natural distribution. Um, so this is all uh, very, very confusing and that's why uh, I want to tackle this now and um, um, uh, yeah, touch this on a genetic basis. So um, the four centuries of trade breeding, hybridization and global SKP population has resulted in a uh, genetic mess or genetic chaos. So now we want to find out how they are related to each other, um, basically using the, the core populations and uh, take genetic samples from them. Um, so the existing uh, studies, as you can see, here, there is there is already a phylogenetic tree, but these existing studies they are largely based on on the morphology of the birds or um, or on captive bred individuals. And it, as we just saw, is that the um, the lovebirds freely hybridize in captivity, and this means that um, we cannot say with with certainty that they are still um, birds that are not hybrids in captivity because of the long history of, of keeping them as cage birds. Um, yeah, and with this, with, with these tools at the end, we can uh, do a lot of, of things related to conservation. For example, um, we could test populations in captivity in, in zoos, um, whether they are uh, have been hybridized or not, and then they would become very, if not, of course, they would become very valuable for eventual reintroduction programs, for example, in, in places where they went extinct in the wild. Um, yeah, so one of the uh, first field trips that I did um, to collect the genetic samples um, was to Malawi. Um, which is here. This Malawi is the war called the Warm Heart of Africa, um, and I went to Lewande National Park, where we find the only population of lovebirds, of Lillian's lovebirds in particular, in Malawi. So the the orange um, distribution are the Lillian's lovebirds, and the light green distribution are the black cheek lovebirds. And this is uh, this was my my team. So ne right next to me is um, Dr. Gawa. Uh, as I said, she's the World Parrot Trust Lovebird Research Officer and has been working with the World Parrot Trust for several years. Um, then next to her, this is Tamara Chiwa. She is the intern of the Wildlife um, and Ecolo Ecological Society of Malawi. So she was uh, helping us and learning a lot. And then this is Patrick, a professional climber, because next to the DNA sampling, we also um, were setting up some nesting boxes. Um, this is Nice and Gawani from the Museum of, of Malawi, and this is um, Pilirani Makwasa, who was also assisting us. Um, and this is how it, how it looked like in the field. So, um, I said earlier on that, that these birds are called shimbuli, which means stupid. And this literally means translated easy to catch. Um, so this we could obviously use for our advantage um, to taking the, the genetic samples. Um, and I, I decided not to make this public of uh, the methods of how we, how we caught them. But um, yeah, if you're interested in this for research reasons, then you can feel free to approach me and I'm gonna uh, yeah, share this information with you. Um, yeah, because in the past it was, it was highly lucrative to, to catch these birds and to sell them on the international market. And uh, obviously we don't want to encourage anybody to, to catch them. Um, so yeah, here on the left-hand side, you can see us working on the field. Um, so we were measuring the birds, taking the blood samples, weighing them, but also giving them a uh, um, ring combination. So these ring combinations are unique for each bird, and this helps us studying the birds further. 
So in these kind of situations, this, the skill transfer um, is highly important. Um, that's why we were working closely together with um, WESIN, the Malawi Wildlife and Ecology Society, um, so that we could learn from each other. Yeah, and this is how, how it looked like in the field. So this is, I, this is actually me being in the tree and taking this picture. Um, this is the, uh, one of the lovebirds peeking out of the cavity, of the natural cavity. And this is, again, the map of where we are in the Liwande National Park. Um, this is the ideal habitat for Lillian's lovebird. This is how it should look like. So they are habitat specialists, highly dependent on Mopani trees, which are these ones, um, and mature uh, Mopani trees, which means they are secondary cavity nesters, which means they are dependent on, um, on existing cavities. So they cannot excavate their own cavities. They basically need to passively wait until yeah, you can imagine a, a branch will fall off and then the rain will wash out a, a natural cavity. Or other birds like, like barbets or woodpeckers um, can excavate a cavity for them. Yeah, but unfortunately, these Mopani trees, uh, Malawi is a very densely populated country in, uh, for African standards. Um, and uh, outside of the, the the national park, the Mopani trees are highly sought after, so they're very valuable for their timber, but also for charcoal. Yeah, and that's why that was one of the reasons why we came in and we, um, in a first time approach, wanted to try um, whether the Lillian's lovebirds would accept um, artificial nesting boxes. Uh, we know from captivity that they would readily breed in those in those boxes, but it has never been tried in the wild. Um, so uh, these are the 60 boxes that we designed um, at the Malawi University of Science and Technology with Dr. Gawa. Um, but we were also considering uh, experts from agriculture, but also from um, from other field biologists who had been doing this um, globally. Yeah, and as you can imagine, there, there is a lot of um, detail and a lot of thought, big thought process behind uh, these boxes because um, we wanted to replicate them to make them as natural as possible. And um, therefore, we relied a lot on Dr. Gower's uh, studies so that we knew in which height we need to uh, set them up. We knew um, uh, how deep they, would, they should be approximately, how wide and all these things. Um, but in a tropical climate, they also need to be durable. And that's why we decided to use uh, PVC pipes and uh, to make them look natural, but also for insulation against the sun, we um, put some wooden, some wood uh, onto the front. And the, the entrance hole, for example, we made just big enough so that the lovebird could enter, but um, that it could also exclude other um, competitors, for example, the bigger parrots that, that are there, or hornbills, for example. Um, and this is the, uh, the study design that, that we decided to go for. So um, here you can see in green, this is Lewanda National Park next to Lake Malambi. And Lillian's lovebirds are communal roosters, so they are non-territorial. And from, again, from Dr. Gawa's research, we knew where the um, breeding sites were, where the roost and where the roosting sites were. So we decided to hang half of the boxes directly into the, um, into the roosting sites, or roosting and breeding sites. So these are, uh, these so this is roosting site one, roosting, roosting site three, and then roosting site uh, two. So parrots are very uh, loyal to their roosting and breeding sites. They're very risk averse and, and they, they don't like to, to use new areas so much. So um, yeah, the idea behind this is to 
first make them familiar with the new new objects in the surrounding and that's why we were hanging them inside the uh, existing breeding areas but then we also wanted to to see whether first of all whether they would accept uh, the ones that are in the breeding areas and then we decided to hang half of the boxes um, so 30 uh, of the boxes in uh, three non breeding sites or non roosting sites um, and these non roosting sites they are about one kilometer or two kilometers away from the uh, uh, existing roosting and breeding sites and yeah it's going to be very exciting to see whether they would also um, or whether they would take these and this is how it looked like in the field how we installed the boxes uh, on the left hand side you can see Tamara the intern of Wesem um, she became very good in, in aiming for the correct tree where we could um, set up the, the rope um, equipment and this is Patrick climbing up the tree and installing a box and on the right hand side this is me um, installing the box. Um, yeah so uh, we want this work to continue in the in the future and um, uh, the World Parish so I was there for um, for a field period, but um, as I said, therefore it's very important to to transfer skills and to learn from each other. So um, uh, Tamara, she learned how to how to use the climbing equipment. Um, then she was very very good in uh, also handling the birds, so she didn't shy away from from touching it from touching them, even though they they can bite and they do bite quite strongly when they are upset. And um, she was even able on one of the last days to explain uh, all these things that she learned to the local students from the Malawi University. So these are behavioral stu uh, biology students and uh, Tamara was demonstrating all the methods that she had learned. Yeah, and in these situations, uh, you don't only share your workspace with these uh, nice cute lovebirds which can bite but also with other um, sometimes more dangerous animals like uh, the elephants or the hippos and we were very very lucky uh, to one day um, also encounter the cheetahs and yeah as I said so this is uh, we were working yeah, every day from early in the morning until uh, late late at night but the work doesn't stop here so uh, the monitoring is going on with uh, Tamara and uh, Dr. Gawa and her students um, she will also install camera traps so um, yeah that we that we can find out more about things that they would carry into the into the cavities the nesting material for example um, and then the, the students can also do their behavioral studies on the lockbirds and ecological studies. Um, so they could use the, um, the ring color combinations that I showed you earlier. So, and answer questions like whether they would use the same cavity around the year, whether they have different cavities for roosting and breeding, um, or how long they would stay in their family groups, for example. Yeah, so after um, Malawi, where we have the population of the Lillian's lovebirds here, um, I'm going to go by the end of the year to, to Zambia. Um, and there we have uh, populations of the black cheek lovebirds and of the Lillian's lovebirds. So these are um, the distribution maps of bird life, but from ground and field research, we know that there's, there are no Lillian's lovebirds in Tanzania, for example, and there are no Lillian's lovebirds here in the um, north of uh, Malawi. So um, this research is also good to, to revise um, yeah, this distribution maps. Um, I had been uh, in an uh, initial uh, um, field work to, to Malawi last year. And uh, just to get familiar uh, with the methods, with the um, with field work, with what we're going to do, and um, also to meet um, 
Chaona Piri, who is the PhD student at the University of Manchester, and um, she is doing her research on the black cheek lovebirds at the moment. Um, yeah, so our initial survey started last year, as I said, developing the, the techniques and the sampling. Um, and in Zambia, there's a similar situation. So the, the black cheek lovebirds are also dependent on the Mopani trees, uh, as you can see here in the background. And um, yeah, during the field work, we, we saw again a lot of other nice, nice wildlife. Um, and then it happened that I uh, went to the Amosia Otunya National Park, um, where I didn't encounter any lovebirds, and there are no, no black cheek lovebirds. Uh, there are no lovebirds in, the, in this um, national park. And I was wondering why, because there are a lot of nice Opani trees which would be suitable. Um, and then I, I went to the, to the Museum of Natural History in Livingston, because I'm also working with, uh, with museum specimen uh, DNA samples. And uh, I was talking to the curator there, and she gave me the, the samples that I was allowed, to, um, the specimens that I was allowed to take samples of. And there I found some specimens of uh, being in Livingston, so exactly from, from this area here, uh, dating back to the 1960s. So I was asking her um, what happened to them because I didn't encounter them there and I, I wouldn't know that they are there. And then she said that there used to be a population of the black cheeked lovebirds, um, which are the ones uh, listed highest on, on the IUCN list. But unfortunately, um, she said due to the pet trade, uh, they have been, due to the trade, they had been um, extirpated from this location. So even though there is a very nice habitat, um, they are not there anymore. And uh, yeah, of course, I, I was thinking about um, the genetic study and how this eventually one day could inform uh, an exact these situations, um, the reintroduction, for example, of to such areas. Um, yeah, one of the uh, next projects that I'm gonna tackle will be in Tanzania. In Tanzania, we do have a population of fishers lovebirds, which I told you earlier as the um, bird that was highest traded in, in the past. And um, we have uh, the mask lovebirds, which you can see here in orange. Um, this one are the Lillian's lovebirds, but they don't occur here. Um, yeah, so I had the chance directly after my, my master's studies to, to join a PhD student on her trip to, to Kenya, actually, which is, and we ended up here being directly at the border of, of Tanzania and Kenya. So this is Kenya and this is Tanzania. And uh, I was able to take some pictures of, of lovebirds at exactly this location. And they looked a bit strange to me because uh, I was thinking, actually, there should be masked lovebirds in, in this area, which are these ones. Um, but then I, I saw these birds. So they look like a fisher's lovebird. This is a fisher's lovebird. They look like a fisher's lovebird, but um, their, their mask is just so dark, dark grayish. Um, yeah, so these are more pictures of, of other individuals there. Um, yeah, so there's uh, likely a, a hybridization already going on. And, um, we know from, from previous research that, that I also told you that there are uh, SKP populations from these species in particular in each other's ranges. So they are um, at some places quite mixed up. And there used to be a barrier directly here in the form of a forest, which is called a Miombo forest, which they wouldn't uh, penetrate, but then um, the whole forest got, uh, or I don't know if the whole forest, but many parts of the forest got uh, deforested and uh, they are now able to meet and they have a hybrid zone there. So this is of, of 
yeah, quite a high uh, conservation concern actually, because this hybridization might lead to, to biodiversity loss. Um, yeah, so it's it's very important to find out what is actually going on uh, with these uh, two species in Tanzania. Yeah, and then um, the, the research gaps paper that uh, we are currently working on um, and are uh, finalizing, um, yeah, where we consulted uh, experts all over Africa, um, it had identified a lot of research gaps. And um, even though we know uh, so much about uh, these birds in captivity, there are huge knowledge gaps um, for them in the in the wild, actually. So, so there are few researchers that have gone out and, and actually studied them in the wild from, from basic um, things like their status or, or distribution. So the, this is the Swindon's lovebird, and this is a very good example because this is the bird we literally know nothing about. Um, it doesn't do well in captivity, it doesn't breed, and I think uh, from what I read, the longest individual that was kept in the captivity was half a year after it then uh, suffocated. Um, yeah, and the distribution of the, of the Swindon's lovebird is the pink one here. This is, again, the bird life distribution. But if you zoom in, I hope I'm able to do this now, um, then you can see that uh, there are only a few dots. And all these dots are actual observations. So these are from GBIF, the uh, Global Biodiversity Information um, Platform. And uh, yeah, these are actually, this is data, different data, for example, observational data from, from birders that, that go out. And um, we all know, know this from, from South Africa. We have the Suburb 2 project here where um, we can uh, nicely, if we spot a species of bird, we can uh, nicely load it up in, onto our smartphones. And um, this is, uh, yeah, seen here. But uh, yeah, we can see some of the dots are outside their suggested range, and there are not a lot of, of, of dots actually here. Yeah, so for, the, uh, for this lovebird in particular, um, there's all basic research uh, lacking. We don't know anything about it. Um, another uh, 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 knowledge, major knowledge gap that was identified is uh, the, the ongoing trade in the Madagascar lovebird and the gray-headed lovebird. So this is a picture from the side of the road. And um, according to CITES, you can see that, especially in the last year, the exports uh, have uh, dramatically increased. So there's still a high demand of these birds. And, and there are, uh, I'm not sure if, if you're aware of it, but there are still um, so for some of these birds legal export quotas. So um, yeah, the problem is that that we don't actually know how this affects the, the populations and, and if this is sustainable in the long term to, to harvest them from the wild. So there are urgent studies necessary. Um, and this species, the black-winged lovebirds, um, from what we know is that uh, invasive species uh, are competing with the habitat, in this case eucalyptus species, um, which uh, are competing with, with their breeding trees that they need uh, or their feeding trees. Uh, this bird has also been observed to breed in, um, uh, well, actually, I don't know the exact species, but it, it uh, breeds in the local species of, of trees and the uh, eucalyptus species from Australia is um, yeah, changing the habitat of this bird. Um, and then for the rosy-faced lovebird, uh, you will find um, here in, in Namibia, but also parts of, of South Africa and Angola. Um, there is a researcher in Namibia who um, who looks at their morpholo morphology. So she looks at the differences in their 
uh, plumage. And uh, she says that there are differences um, in the populations in the far north and differences in the, so they look different from the populations in the far south. So um, there's again, yeah, genetics, ne genetic research necessary to see uh, whether they are, whether these are actually different species or subspecies. And uh, another a major knowledge gap is uh, here, to be seen here in the red faced love, lovebirds. So uh, I started this um, knowledge gap paper by sending out a questionnaires to the lovebird experts. And um, a lot of questionnaires on the uh, red faced lovebirds came back with, with concerns about people seeing them being sold at the side of the road and uh, as extracted from the wild. So there's definitely a research needed on, on trade in, in these birds, um, yeah, apart from the distribution or status or, or the breeding biology of these birds. Yeah, I think I've uh, exceeded the time a little bit, but I want to, on this last slide, I uh, want to thank you for for your attention and again for having me here. Um, for any questions that you might have, you can address them here to this email address, uh, which you can note down or you can ask them right now. Um, and yeah, I, I also want to say that I'm very, very grateful for uh, the ongoing support that we have received um, from various different partners um, to make these these, this research and, and this conservation of, of wild African lovebirds are possible. So um, yeah, to keep this, these projects going, we always are um, looking for partners, for, for organizations to partner up. And um, yeah, if, if um, you want to make a contribution, um, yeah, please get in touch or, or go to our, our website on parrots.org. And uh, yeah, I'm happy uh, for everyone who's interested in lovebirds and who wants to support and, and learn about them because they're amazing birds. And yeah, one last thing, if, if you want to follow these projects, especially the genetic project um, and also other fields, uh, conservation projects that we do on, on lovebirds, um, feel free to like our Facebook page on the World Parrot Trust Africa program. And uh, we are currently updating this on a weekly basic basis with some stories from the field or photos from the field. So um, some interesting stuff going on there. All right. Thank you very much, Sikom. Thanks a lot, Sasha. That's uh, really great stuff. Um, uh, really interesting presentation and uh, really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. So there are a few questions in the in the chat room. And if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I'm going to just allow uh, people to turn on their mics as well. If you want to just ask the question using your voice, you should be able to do so now. Um, yes. Uh, so the first question was, um, do you have any preliminary idea of the effect of the pet trade on the various species? Any preliminary idea? So, um, yeah, as I said, um, when I was in, in Zambia and the, the black cheek lovebirds, they have the smallest distribution um, of all the lovebirds and um, they have the smallest population as well. Um, so we know that there are currently two existing populations of them, and uh, yeah, there's this, this one population that had been uh, wiped out because of the pet trade in the past in um, the Musi Autunia National Park. And yeah, I would say uh, definitely um, for them because they have the smallest distribution, but then for the for the fishers lovebirds in Tanzan Tanzania, there was a population estimate being done in the in the nineties, and this is actually what what I'm gonna do next year. And what I would like to do is to re reassess this population and to see how how it's developed. So how 
uh, whether the numbers have declined or whether the numbers have uh, increased and um, yeah, to see whether, whether trade is, is still a big problem for the fishers love grid. I mean, in just 10 years, a half a million individuals being exported, which is it's just it's crazy because this is the uh, I, I we don't see this in any other birds. Um, so this has a huge effect um, on their populations, definitely. But on the other hand, they also um, they also breed quite well. Um, so they would they would breed quite well in captivity and um, at least eight of the, the nine species. And therefore you would think that, that the extraction from the wild shouldn't be such a big problem anymore. Um, yeah, but it's definitely interesting to find out how this affects or still affects the populations. So there's a couple of comments here from Elizabeth who uh, says that 15 years ago, she was a, a breeder of these birds, and she also observes that the wild ones don't actually make great pets. Um, yeah. And Alma in Saudi Arabia says, uh, thank you, Sasha, for the work. Great presentation. Pity about the attractiveness of trading for some people. It is. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, I'll say thank you very much, Sasha. Um, this uh, video is, uh, this presentation is recorded and we will have it on the Learn the Birds YouTube channel. Um, I can't guarantee you in how many days, uh, but hopefully um, before this time next week. All right, thanks very much, Sasha. And, uh, Good luck with your research and uh, maybe we'll uh, have you back in a year or so and uh, see what you've learned. Yes, please. Um, yeah, it's definitely uh, uh, staying interesting. <laughs> um, I'm very, very excited about the outcome of, of this research and how this is going. And there, because there's just so much to do and um, yeah, so much work necessary on this bird. So. Um, and it's it's amazing, uh, especially doing the field work, um, going out and, and seeing them in the wild. And um, yeah, it's definitely uh, interesting. Uh, I think I've seen millions in uh, in uh, the in the Zambezi Valley, if I remember correctly, and uh, yeah. rosy faced in Namibia. But a long time ago, before I was really into birding, so I need to go back to those places. <laughs> yeah, we should go together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay, take care and have a Thank great evening, much. everybody, or have a great day, depending on where you are, or a great night. Bye bye for now. Okay, bye bye. And remember to follow us on Facebook. <laughs>